Welcome to everyone uh, on this special St. Patrick's Day podcast of 100 plus. Uh, it seemed like the thing to do. And so um, um, on this day when Chicagoans turn the river green uh, and uh, dye their beer green and all of that, we have the privilege of talking to uh, an Irish church history scholar from Dublin, Dr. Miriam Kelly. So, uh, Dr. Kelly, welcome. Um, how you. are things in Dublin today? Uh, well, as we say in Dublin, it's a soft day in Dublin today, which means it's raining. <laughs> <laughs> but it's lovely. It's really nice. Yeah, it's good. Thank you. I have um, I have not uh, been to Dublin. I, mm -hmm. I have. I know it's you know it's the capital, and you have more than a million people, and it's a you know twenty first century city. But I have this image of medieval. Yeah. Dublin and uh, yes, rain is part of it. So um, yep. yeah, that's what we call it a soft day. If it's raining, it's a nice, polite way to say Ireland, you know, it rains quite a lot, but but not, I mean, there's sunshine as well. Okay, well, <laughs> so uh, thank you for joining us. So about a year ago, um, yeah. I did a podcast on St. Patrick. Um, so yes. I'm, I'm doing this 100 a hundred pivot points and yep. we were there. Yeah. So had already covered, sort of picked up with the fall or picked up at the end of the book of Acts and covered the fire in Rome and the fall of Jerusalem and then marched through uh Constantine and Nicaea and uh the New Testament formation and uh Augustine and the sack of Rome and all of that, uh, and eventually came to St. Patrick. Yeah. And uh so we're doubling back to him today because it's St. Patrick's Day and uh, yep. and also going to think a little bit about Irish church history and and uh, sure. Celtic Christianity. So yep. let me just say for those uh, joining us that uh, Dr. Kelly is uh, a professor at Irish Bible Institute yep. and where among other things she teaches on uh, Irish society and Irish church history and uh so that that is as close as we're going to get to an expert on St. Patrick. Uh, is is St. Patrick a, is St. Patrick's Day a big day in Ireland? Oh, it is. Yeah, it's a very big day in Ireland. And because we haven't had one in two years, uh, everybody is so looking forward to Patrick's Day this year. And yeah. and I mean, in Chicago, we do turn we we die. There's this. Um, it's like the plumbers union or the electrical union. Somebody dies the river green. Uh, oh, yeah. Nobody's supposedly supposedly ecologically safe. I, I I think they keep the how they do this a secret. But what uh, what do you do in Ireland on St. Patrick's Day? Uh, well, it's a bank holiday. It's it's a start of a holy day. It's also a bank holiday. So the the, the parade normally begins maybe around twelve or one o'clock. Uh, in Dublin city centre, but all around the country, there's little parades as well. And sometimes there's a, a river called the River Liffey that flows through Dublin, the capital city, um, and it separates north side from south side. And sometimes they, they dye that uh, green and some of the buildings and uh, people wear their Irish shamrocks and the, you know, the tricolour, the green, white and orange, and, and then the parades take place. So it's very colourful. Uh, and uh, the theme this year is connections. Actually, there's normally a theme uh, for every year in St. Patrick's Day. So the theme this year is connections, which is quite apt, I think, for um, for the days that we're living in. Connections with other nations and other people. Well, glad to make uh, this cross the pond connection with you. And yeah. uh, I should say to everybody, so about, I think, 10% of the people actually watch this, 90% just listen. Great. So I put on green. We were, we're recording this on Saturday. It's not St. Patrick's Day when we're recording this. but uh, I've green on too. My, my, okay. my, my, my blouse is green. You may not okay. see it on camera. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, well, with that out of the way, so let me just yeah. say I, I was encouraged when I started looking over your CV and other things okay. to see that uh, among the things that you speak on right on, uh, your your lectures on St. Patrick uh, talk about the man in the myth. Yeah, and uh, I went back and, and was looking at my notes from my podcast a year ago, and I I opened by saying on March seventeenth, in honor of Patrick, the great Irish saint who chased all the snakes out of Ireland, 
who was the first to take the gospel to the Irish and who used a, a three-leaf clover to explain the Trinity. People all over the world put on green, drink green beer, and uh, dye their rivers green and talk about shamrocks. Yeah. And I said, except Patrick was not Irish. Uh, he was never officially named a, sna- a, a saint. Uh, he's not the first to take the gospel to Ireland. He did not drive out saints from Ireland. There, there never were any. Uh, no evidence that he used the clover to explain the Trinity. Uh, and um, drinking green beer, I think, is something that people just decided they wanted to blame on somebody else. So uh, I was scared you were going to correct me on all those things, but uh, I take it that um, fake news is not a new thing. There's a lot of stories about uh, Patrick that are not true. There certainly is. And and separating the man from the myth is really uh, interesting. And and I think you said in your podcast as well, uh, the man's story and testimony is actually more interesting than the myths that we have about him. (laughs) Uh, Well, well, let's so let's let's hear some of those stories. Uh, okay. I, I think. Do you run across people? I mean, it, you have such a different uh, perspective being in Ireland on Patrick. Uh, I, I suspect there are people in the United States that have him a little bit in the tooth fairy category, uh, leprechauns, and he, they don't they don't know that he was a real person. Do you do you run into that at all? Are people surprised that he's a, an actual person and a, and a saint and a significant player? Um, in, in Ireland, St. Patrick is it, like he'd be taught as part of the courses in Irish history in every school in Ireland. So everybody knows that Patrick is a real person. Um, and most people in Ireland would probably know about his testimony or his confessio, as we call it, one of the primary sources that he wrote. And some of the excerpts from his uh, confessio and his like his time to me, the, the modern day confessio is his personal testimony of faith and his life. Um, that he dedicated to the Lord in in Christianese. And the vast majority of Irish people would know that. Uh, It's people, I think, from other countries believe the myths and the shamrock and, and, you know, the snakes and stuff like that. Right. So, and you don't, you really don't have snakes in Ireland. We don't have snakes in Ireland, no. Uh, (laughs) Now, some people may call some of our, you know, some of our our top people, uh, you know. Your politicians? uh, Yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, But uh, no, we don't. have mosquitoes in Ireland? I mean, did you you just sort of avoid all the bad stuff? We don't really have mosquitoes as such. Um, We do a little bit in the summertime, but it's not like Miami and Florida that, you know, full of mosquitoes sometimes. No, we don't have anything like that, really. We. We've very few poisonous things in Ireland, like animals or anything like that. Okay, well, uh, it is raining, so I'll, uh, although it's like nine degrees here today in Chicago, so um, oh, I don't okay. know. Dublin is sounding better all the time. Well, right. let's let's talk about Patrick. So, yeah, fascinating life. It seems to me like it, the the fascination starts when we hear that he's kidnapped at the age of sixteen. Is that that's, that's right? True. Yeah. Yeah, he opens his testimony, his confession by saying, my name is Patrick. I'm a sinner, a simple country person. And then he says, I was about 16 at the time when I was taken prisoner Mm -hmm. and I was taken into captivity into Ireland along with thousands of others. Mm -hmm. So that's the first um, sort of oldest voice that comes from our Irish past. Um, And that's the first thing that he says in his confession. So that is true. We, We also there's like. There's probably eight manuscripts um, from maybe the seventh and eighth century that have come down to us that that record St. Patrick's confession. So we know he wrote this himself towards the end of his life. Hmm. Um, And he wanted other people to know um, of the evangelism, but also the acknowledgement of what God did in his life Hmm. um, when he became a Christian. So let's just set the stage. He's he's growing up in uh, in. Britain and yeah. Britain is still is part of the the Roman Empire, but the Roman Empire is in decline. It is, yeah. And yeah. Ireland is not part of the Roman Empire. Ireland was never part of the Roman Empire. We're on the most westerly side of Europe. I mean, the next the next country to us, if you go due west, is Nova Scotia, Canada, which is mm. thousands of miles away from us. Where we're on the westerly side of of uh, Europe, so the Romans never came to Ireland. It's an island nation. As far as they got was Britain, which is our next door neighbor. Hmm. But it never came to Ireland. That so, doesn't mean now that there wasn't trade. There was trade and stuff, but the Roman Empire never ruled Ireland. 
So, so what what are we to think of the Irish back then? So they're kidnapping. Are they? I mean, I almost have this image of Vikings. I know this is pre-Viking raids. Yeah. But I have yeah. image of marauders and uh, rough rough necked druids and. Uh, I suppose in in the fifth century Ireland, Ireland was was based on clan and tribal affiliations. And and some historians think there's maybe about 100 clans or tribes in Ireland in the fifth century. And very subsistence farming, very rural and mostly pagan. Um, We do know before St. Patrick came that a man called Palladius was sent from Pope Celestine to come to Ireland. Um, And that was a year before Patrick came, but we don't know anything about him. All we know is that he was sent to the Irish and he didn't last long and he went back to Rome. (laughs) That's all we know about him. So we know that there could have been- his name was Palladius? Palladius. Now it was nothing got to do with the Palladian theory or or anything like that. His name was Palladius. I was going to say, because I know that there's some overlap between uh, Patrick and fighting Pelagianism, but this is a completely different guy, different. uh, Yeah. Yeah. He was sent by uh, the Pope uh, to the Irish. So so when we're thinking about Patrick at this time, he says thousands of people are taken They're They're taken slaves. This is this is they are slaves on the 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 island of ireland and they're going to live very i mean they're going to live as slaves this is a brutal life oh yeah yeah slavery in the fourth and fifth century was very common not just in ireland but across the uh, the known world slave slavery (laughs) was quite common so i i've I've read some things some suggestions that uh that that patrick's writings are uh are, are wrong and that he's sort of spinning history and that he was actually a slave trader, not a slave. Is there, are you, you're familiar yeah. with that? Any, any yeah. way to refute that? Um, I think that would be very highly unlikely. In fact, he wrote his second primary source is called a letter to the soldiers of Caroticus uh, in which he uh, lambastes slave traders um, so because he himself a slave, um, no, there's no evidence that he was actually a slave trader himself. None whatsoever. I've, I've, I've also read that he's the first person to sort of come out uh, uncategorically against slavery as a as a concept. Is that? Is there- we, we we think so, because, I mean, his letter was maybe the fifth and sixth century. That was the first time in written history and language that is written down that it was a very strong attack on the slave trade and Caroticus and his soldiers, definitely. So he spends six years in Ireland as a slave. Yeah. And what is, yeah. he, what is he doing? Well, he, he says in his confession, he says that um, he actually came to faith in Ireland while he was uh, a slave. And he, he said that he uh, stayed in captivity for six years and that uh, he, he, he minded or he looked after uh, tended sheep every day for, well, we think it was sheep, sheep or, or, or pigs, but probably sheep uh, on a mountainside. So that was his job. His mm-hmm. job was to look after uh, sheep uh, on some type of mountain somewhere. We, we, there's no locations or no names mentioned that we can verify from his uh, from his confession. But we think it's in the west of Ireland. And, and how, how I mean, I, I know that his. I think is I think I read that his grandfather was a was a pastor yeah. or a priest and that his father there was some religious uh connections but it didn't look like it was serious so does he yeah. do we know anything about how it is that he suddenly comes to a more robust faith in Christ Yeah, he says in his confession, he said, it was there in Ireland that the Lord opened my eyes um, to the awareness of his lack of faith. And even though he said it came about late, I recognized that these were my failings. So I turned with all my heart to the Lord, my God, and he looked down on my lowliness and had mercy on my youthful ignorance. So Mm -hmm. that's when he actually became sort of a Christian on the mountain when he was in slavery. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I know that. Well, we know that he's literate because he's obviously he's writing things. I, I know just from watching being with some shepherds that it's a it's a very uh, lonely, boring. Uh, yeah. I mean, 
So he's got a lot of time to think and to pray. I I read that he said he prayed a hundred times a day. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he said, after I arrived in Ireland, I tended my sheep every day and I prayed frequently during the day and more and more the love of God increased and my sense of awe before God and his faith grew. So I think it probably helped him while he was a slave because of his faith. And I also think he learned the language while he was here for the six years. And he learned an awful lot about the culture of Ireland and maybe the paganism that was there. And so he he understood the Irish culture, the language and the people very well from his six years as a slave. Because he he must have had some interaction with the the tribe that he was a slave uh, under. So and then then he has some visions that encourage him to escape and he uh, yeah, he yeah. takes off. He does. Yeah, he escapes. He was guided by a, a voice. And then he was rec- uh, and then after six years. And then so we know that he returns to uh, his own land again and his own family uh, via on a ship. Uh, and his journey on the ship is recorded in his confession. And um, and that's where we think he then um, his education and becoming more uh, probably theologically literate um, uh, became evident during this time that he actually went back to England to his family. I'm trying to imagine that uh, homecoming because his family likely thought he was dead. I mean, it's been oh, yeah. six years and uh, yeah. he shows up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. So, so uh, he returns home, but, but then pretty quickly he ends up in, does he go to France? I mean, at some point he he engages in some theological training and I'm, I'm sort of curious as to what that might've been like. He doesn't say he, he, and it's very, he doesn't say uh, about what, how he was educated, where he was educated or whatever else. Um, And in some of it, he calls himself the Bishop to Ireland, but uh, we don't think that he was actually ordained a Bishop. We're not even too sure whether that, because I know in your podcast, you were even talking about that as well. Again, it's speculation as to whether he became a Bishop or not, but like, he would have had the, the Roman Empire, yes, and Roman Catholicism, and he would have uh, had the full thorough education because when he came back to Ireland, he was an amazing missionary, and he certainly had a Trinitarian uh, Orthodox view of Christianity. Hmm. You know? So does, I, I, I know there's some, we, we talked about Palladius, and I, I was trying to distinguish him from Pelagian mm-hmm. Pelagius. Yeah. So I, I read that there's some... Uh, I mean, there's Pelagianism afoot at this point, um, yeah. and, and he interacts with that. No, it doesn't say that he interacts with that because in his confession, his confession is very Trinitarian based and very much Roman Orthodox uh, theology. But nowhere does it talk about him um, confronting Pelagius or anything like that at all or the Pelagian theories. Again, I think that's from later sort of maybe hagiographies and, and manuscripts that have come around. Okay, I should I should just um, level set the room here. So just reminding people Pelagius is a is also a Brit uh, mm. and he interacts with uh, Augusta and he he goes down when Rome falls, he he heads down. Uh, and ends up at the church that um, mm-hmm. Augustine is uh, preaching at, and he does yeah. not like Augustine's emphasis on grace, and, and yeah. actually becomes uh, quite a critic of Augustine. And Augustine mm-hmm. challenges him and writes these uh, explaining salvation by grace through faith. Yeah. So Pelagianism is a uh, a heretical movement that calls on people to be really, really good. Yeah. And Augustine fights that. And so it's one yeah. of the early church battles. And a hagiography, uh, a term you used, is is a um, sort of a fake spiritual slant on somebody's life. It makes them look better than they are. So this yeah. is one of the things you think where maybe we've got some um, yeah. fake news. Yeah, be- yeah, because it doesn't come across now in his confession or in his letter to Chroticus at all. I mean, it is like his scripturally based uh, testimony is very evident from his confession um, and very much Trinitarian, very much, uh, yes, grace orientated and and that Jesus is our only savior. And um, 
You see, as well because Ireland wasn't Romanized or wasn't conquered by Rome, their type of Christianity was slightly different than the Roman model. And that's where people uh, come to think of Celtic Christianity or monasticism mm -hmm. uh, in relation to Roman Catholicism. It was slightly different. Um, it probably wasn't until the 12th century that Ireland became more Roman Catholic in, in, in its culture and in its um, formation of the Christian church. But before that, it wasn't so much Roman, even though it was orthodox in theology, but the outworking of it was quite different. Okay. Well, I want to go there in a second, but let's let's yeah. talk about Patrick as a as a missionary. So he shows yeah. up, he comes back. Yeah. He has 10, 20 years back in Europe before well, back in Britain before he decides whether he's commissioned, we don't know, but somehow yeah. he goes back to Ireland as a missionary to the people that had kidnapped him. Yeah, he, he had a vision from the Irish and um, from the young Irish saying, uh, please, oh, holy boy, come back to us um, and give us your faith. So he was having uh, visions and then he woke up and then I don't know how he he left again, especially after being a slave. I mean, he was an amazing man um, in relation to the um, I think he felt that he was called of God to come back to the Irish and to Christianize Ireland. Mm. Um, and he certainly did it in spades um, mm. uh, because his confession talks about his his 30 years of ministry. And um, we think it spanned about 30 years of ministry. And because he knew the culture, he'd go to the tribal chiefs or kings um, and to their daughters um, and, and then talk about the Christian faith. Because, he, as you said, once he knew that he could uh, convert the, the, the tribe of the Chishim, well, then everybody else would become Christian as well. Hmm. So do we know, um, yeah, I, I remember reading that, that, you know, perhaps tens of thousands of people are converted and baptized and he plants hundreds of churches, but, but there's a little concern that maybe those numbers get inflated. Yeah, I, I mean, we're not really too sure. He doesn't say. He says thousands have come to faith. I think some estimates have been that he may have planted maybe 300 Christian communities around Ireland in the space of the 30 years that was here. Huh. Um, and I'd say that's more realistic. Now, they could have been small communities because there may not have been more than half a million people in Ireland in the fifth century. Ireland was, you know, there wasn't that many in, in Ireland at that time. So, so um, I've read and, and shared a little bit in the first podcast that, that some of his writings suggest that maybe he struggled with some depression or he's a little yeah. bit more introspective than, than a lot of people writing at that time would, they don't, they don't share that kind of uh introspective kind of stuff very much. Yeah, that's what I love about St. Patrick or his writings. He's so honest. Uh, it, like he he really had a tough time in Ireland. And sometimes I think he did feel like giving up, but he just felt that the call of God was so strong in his life that he just kept going, um, which is amazing because he's both human and uh, a saint at the same time, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and that's what I love about uh, St. Patrick. And and he does say that he has, uh, like, th a lot of people, there was opposition probably towards him as well in Ireland, especially from uh, people, um, you know, who had something to lose by people becoming Christian, mm. you know. So he definitely had lots of opposition uh, in Ireland during, during his 30 years, you know. Um, and I think as well in England uh, at the time, um, the, 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 the church in England looked down upon Ireland as barbarians and they didn't want anybody to go to Ireland. Do, do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So him going back to Ireland would have been quite problematic as well. And that's why he talks about, you know, some of the people that he knew didn't appreciate where he was going either. But he went anyway. Mm. Yeah. So, so. How has how has Patrick and your study of Patrick and his his confessions and all of this, how has he shaped your faith or your devotional practices? I, I think one of the things that I love uh, about St. Patrick is that he is a real person. 
Um, and he's not he's not a, a person from the Bible. We have biblical books and we, um, we, we look at the life of St. Paul, which was an amazing journey of faith. Um, and I see I, I see Patrick uh, in that vein. And that's why I love his testimony or his confession, because we have so much about him as a real man, him coming to faith then as a slave as well, and then going back home, but then coming back to the Irish and staying with them probably for the rest of his life. Um, because he had such a, a love, not just for, for Christ, but for also for evangelism, w- which I find is incredible. And it's very humbling when you think about somebody like that. And you're thinking, you know what, we're standing on shoulders of giants like Patrick Mm -hmm. in Ireland. And we have an obligation to actually then follow on and take on the mantle from him and continue to evangelize and spread the gospel in Ireland. And maybe that's why I ended up in Irish Bible Institute. (laughs) Um, Right. Right. Well, is there a do you have a favorite um, resource that you recommend for people who are not Patrick scholars, not Irish? history scholars a movie a book um yeah and um, thomas o'loughlin is a, is a scholar in england he's irish actually and he he wrote a book called discovering saint patrick and that's a really good book it, it came out in 2005 and it's called discovering saint patrick and he goes through the life of saint patrick and and some of the issues that have come up and stuff like that that's a really good one and okay. then at uh, uh, Elva Johnson, she's a professor in UCD, uh, University College Dublin, and I think she's done about a 15 minute podcast on St. Patrick, the man and the myth as well. You can look that up, too. Okay. Um, and that gives a little bit of an understanding of St. Patrick. So it would be two that I would recommend. And, and uh, I hate to make a concession to modern culture, mm-hmm. but are there movies that um, that um, are out there? And um, there, there's a, a guy called uh, Fergal Keane, and he he done a, a five part uh, series on the story of Ireland for the BBC. And one of the one of the the um, series, I think it's is, is series two or video two that on the documentary is about St. Patrick. And that's okay. a really good one to see. I think it's on YouTube. Okay. If, if you can look at you, I think it's there. His name is uh, Fergal Keane. Um, okay. And he'd. And I think it's called The Story of Ireland, and it's five one-hour documentaries. It's a really good uh, one to look at. Okay, well, let, so let me pivot us to um, to Celtic Christianity. I know uh, I know very little here. Um, I don't yeah. even think I'd heard the term. Well, I'd heard the term uh, yeah. Celtic before fifteen years ago because of the Boston Celtics. But we don't yeah. say Boston Celtics. We say yeah. Boston Celtics. I had not even, I mean, it didn't even occur to me uh, for a long time. That's what we were mm. referring to. So yeah. um, it seemed like about 15 years, Celtic, 15 years ago, Cel- Celtic Christianity started to emerge somewhat with music and somewhat with a mm. Celtic cross. I just started to go, huh, I don't, I don't know much about this. What is this? Where is it coming from? And uh, so, so let's start at the most basic level. You said yeah. uh, that the Irish were separated from the continent and Roman Catholicism, and there's this Celtic Christianity. It's a little bit different yeah. until the 12th century. How yeah. was it different? Okay, well, one of the first things to say is, um, insofar as Celtic societies um, was concerned, it was non-hierarchical and it was sort of loosely organized the churches in the Celtic lands, okay? But the term Celtic only came into use around the 18th century. And it was actually invented to describe a group of languages, the Celtic languages. So if you're trying to define uh, Celtic Christianity, it applies to the native indigenous Christian faith practiced in the British Isles um, and also in the Celtic speaking areas, especially Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. Okay. Okay. So in other words, the Christianity of the Gaelic speaking populations of the British Isles and Ireland is considered Celtic Christianity. Okay. But there's no unified and cohesive characteristics of Celtic Christianity. What we do have is the rise of, of Celtic monasticism or Irish monasticism. And it would be more probably correct to talk about the characteristics of monasticism that grew out of Ireland 
because it was slightly different than the monasticism that you would see in other countries. Okay, I want to talk about sense? that in, in yeah. just a second. But you you mentioned Gaelic, so does this tie back to? This is a leap here. Is this tie yeah. back in any sense to the Galatians? I mean, are we? Is it, is it the same? Yes, um, it, Galatia and Galicia was part of some of the Gaelic or Celtic. Celtic origins and the, the Celtic cultures. And um, even in our music, uh, Galatian music and Galatian culture is quite similar to Ireland in some ways. So as it is in Scotland, as it is in, in Wales and some parts of Gaul, uh, as they were talking about. And um, okay. so, yes. So that spread across uh, Europe, BC into the AD. Um, and that's where they, they use the term uh, sort of uh, Celtic. For want of okay. but it's so, about language more so than than a cohesive uh, population. So, so uh, I want to talk about monasticism uh, yeah. generally, and then the the monastic movements in uh, that are Celtic. But hmm. let me ask a a, a question because I'm not certain that I could answer this. Are there any substantive theological differences between? Celtic Christianity and Orthodox Christianity. Was there anything, was there any aberrant views that developed among the Celts okay. that then get corrected later on? Well, I suppose Celtic Christianity thrived in, in sort of the 5th to the 11th centuries. And probably the primary site of worship and pastoral care was the monastery rather than a parish church. So there's some distinctive features in, in, in relation to the uh, monasticism in Ireland. Um, and even though there was no written texts, um, they had monastic rules, they had handbooks for penance, aestheticism was part of their, their daily life as well. But during the 6th and 7th centuries, um, some of the Irish monasteries became like well-established schools and they were well known for their scholarship and stuff. But they had orthodox views of Christianity and um, some of their maybe practices were a little bit more aesthetic and um, mm -hmm. uh, um, and, and purity of your spirit and purity of mind and purity of body was quite uh, an important part of monasticism. Okay. Um, so. Uh, I, 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 by the way, I love your accent. I just want to be sure. Did you say aesthetic or ascetic? Uh, aesthetic, as in aesthetic or aesthetic, whichever uh, you, whatever. It, it's a bit like um, the aestheticism of monasticism in Ireland wasn't just about uh, being alone and being in solitude. Most of the monasteries in Ireland were actually based around community which okay. is quite different than some of the ones, say, on, on Iona, the island of, of Iona, or on Skellig Michael out in the, the wilds of nowhere. Okay, um, so uh, fascinating, and, and I hope we're not uh, geeking out too much here on no, no. language and people mm -hmm. for, for the listeners, but I'm, I'm still confused. So I think there, there is an, uh, an asceticism that is sort of... Uh, a, a, it's it's a very simplistic, in some sense, harsh. I'm going to punish myself. I'm going to limit myself. Yeah. And and there, so there's ascetic, and I think that's the word that you're using. There's yep. also the word aesthetic, which is more artistic and beauty, and and I'm tying in that way. So you're using the ascetic, the first one. You're saying that the monastic movement in Ireland is is got some ascetic overtones, some simple yes. overtones. Okay. Yes. But it was also aesthetic as well in art and illuminated manuscripts. So it was actually both. OK, yeah. Well, I think of the Book of Kells and I think, yeah. of, yes, the beauty and all of that. So, yeah. OK, yeah. so we've got both of them going. Thank mm -hmm. you. So uh, and I know that monastic movements tend to divide between those where I'm alone and those where I'm in community. So you're saying yeah. it's a communal kind of experience for the Celtics. Definitely. And yeah. So. So I think it's important. So most people listening here are Protestant. And so the whole monastic idea of somebody becoming mm -hmm. a monk is a little bit foreign. Yeah. So this is usually a, a move towards purity, a move towards uh, correction, like getting it right, getting a deeper walk with Christ. Is that is that a fair way to describe this? 
In in part, it was the monastic movement was in part like that because most of the monasteries maybe contained they were in a round enclosure and there was always a church, there was always a dining area, a scriptorium would be normally there, a guest house, and beehive huts would be there in Ireland in the fifth and sixth century. So it wasn't just about going away from the world; it was actually part of the Christianization of Ireland as well. Okay. So um, let me just say scriptorium. So this is where one of the things that the that the monks, especially the Irish. Um, yeah. So I want to ask you in a second what you think of Cahill's book, uh, How the Irish yeah. Saved Civilization. But just want to note for, for listeners that uh, before there were printing presses, right, before Wittenberg comes along, uh, you have monks that are copying yeah, the Bible. So a scriptorium yeah. and not just the Bible, other great works. I mean, I think this is yeah. part of what Cahill argues that the Irish saved civilization, because while Rome is declining and falling and yeah. the barbarians are taking over, you have these monastic communities that are healthy and people are being educated and books are yeah. being saved. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what's happening in this monastic movement. St. Benedict and others. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, in Ireland, so yeah. let me ask, do you think that Cahill's book, I, I'm assuming you're very familiar with the book. Yeah, yeah. Um, he doesn't write, I don't believe, as a Christian. He's got a number of historical works. Do you, yeah, you think yeah. he gets it mostly right? Uh, it's slightly hyperbole. Um, it's it's a little bit overstated, I think. Okay. Uh, that must be hard for uh, you to say as a, you, no. being a good Irish person. You wanna, no. You want to no, save I, the civilization, right? I, I, I do. I do, but as an academic, uh, um, okay. it, I, th I think he overstates it uh, slightly. And uh, certainly the, the, the Irish didn't save civilization, but they had a great uh, part in extending uh, a thorough education, as in not just in theology, but in rhetoric, but in scriptures, but in uh, poems, the oral tradition being written down. So they had a huge love of learning. Uh, in Irish monasteries, an absolute huge love of learning, but not just for themselves as part of evangelization as, as well, but a part of education of the civilization that would, they were situated in. That was a huge part of it as well. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why Ireland is called the land of saints and scholars, because the monks were not just holy men, they were also scholars. Mm. So um, I know there are other uh, significant names coming out of uh, Irish church history. Um, yeah. So so we have uh, Columba. Yeah, St. Right? Columba. Yeah, uh, St. Columba or St. Colum Kill, sometimes he's called. He was born in maybe around 521. And he was probably the first noted Christian leader to leave Ireland to minister elsewhere. So he founded many monasteries in Ireland. But in around 563, he Columbus sailed to Iona, which is north of Ireland, uh, off the Scottish Isle of uh, Scotland. And it was a small island off the coast of Scotland with 12 of his followers. And he, he established a monastic centre there. So he was very influential. Which is still there, right? I mean, yes. Oh, guess? yes. Yeah, that's still there. The island of Iona is very uh, well known, not just in Ireland, but all over the world. People still right. come and, and stay there for the weekend or for, for, you know, for maybe a retreat. Well, I'll put that on the bucket list. It sounds yeah. um, it sounds like a place to, to spend a few yeah. days. So so uh, so we have the Irish maybe not saving all of civilization, but we have this monastic movement to sort of preserve scriptures the and again on the uh, across the pond here across the the yeah. strait we have uh the roman empire collapsing we're moving into yeah. quote unquote the dark ages we're moving into the yeah. early middle ages and so the barbarians are are uh, ravaging what was left of uh the roman empire and civilization yeah so this is the idea that the Irish are saving civilization is in that you have yes. people like Columba that are now taking yeah. the Christian faith and education yeah. and moving back into Europe. Yes, they are. And I'm, I'm one of the probably the best known is St. Columbanus. And he lived in 540 to around 615. And he had a significant impact in Europe in the 6th and 7th century in France, in Italy and in Switzerland. 
Um, and he was an amazing writer as well. We've lots of his writings um, that have uh, been preserved. Um, and one of the things that he was, he, he was a pioneer who inspired later people in Ireland going to Europe and going to a further places of the world. So St. Columbanus is his name. He was an amazing uh, guy. He left with 12 disciples as well. And he sailed to Brittany, which is in France. And uh, and what happened was uh, they immediately began preaching. And the king at the time was called Sig- King Sigbert. Um, and he persuaded the king that he could teach them all about the faith, Christian faith, but as well as culture and civilization, in other words, in education. And the, the, the king provided them land for missionaries and they established monasteries then. So mm-hmm. he was the first one that sort of expanded the, um, the, the, the gospel and Christianization, but also education and culture into Europe. And from there, then it fanned out all over Europe in the next 100 to 150 years. So, um, well, there's certainly something for us to, to learn. There. I, by the way, I have to say one of my uh, frustrations with um, church history and the Bible is what I call my Elijah Elisha problem. You know, so you've got uh, St. Columba and St. Columbanus, and I'm yeah. supposed to remember which is yeah. which. It's just yeah. like, oh, my goodness. Could we not, you know, I mean. Elijah and Elisha, like, okay, they're just sort of, they occupy one little file folder in my head and I'm always trying to tease them apart. So, so, um, so you have this uh, Columbanus who's, who's taking education out. This is, is Benedict Irish? I I should know this. No. So, but, but we have, so I, I equate some of what this, the Cahill, the Irish saving civilization, yeah. the monastic uh, preservation of things with now the Benedict option that gets advocated. And that is that there are these communities of health that need to sort of withdraw from a decaying Western civilization and be ready to be missionaries again. Yeah, um, yeah. So do you look missiologically, do you look at uh, you know, starting with Patrick and looking at Columba and Columbanus and see sort of marching orders and ideas that we ought to have today for how to sort of turn the tide? I, I think some of the characteristics of the monastic Christianity is that they wanted to extend the church's mission. Um, and it wasn't just the saving of their own souls. It was the saving other other people's souls as well. So part of it was... Um, they also had male and females. There wasn't just monks, there was abbeys and abbesses as well. So there was females as well in the 5th and 6th and 7th century. And an awful lot of it was community-based. So it wasn't just on their own. But an awful lot of it was holistic education. So grammar, writing, scriptures, biographies, um, theology, arts, all of that type of stuff, I think, um, the, the the monastic people really, really appreciated. So it wasn't just a theology that was very narrow. It was a fully orbed education, like head, hands and heart. Yep. Um, yep. And I think sometimes that's what we need maybe in, in 21st century. It's not just about the head. It's also about the heart and our hands, how we apply um, theology in our own lives and ministry and actually walk the walk uh, and not just have it as an academic exercise, even though I know I'm an academic, but I also live the, well, I hope to live the gospel every day, just like yeah. you. Yeah. Well, so, so let me ask this. Uh, when people listening hear Celtic Christianity, and I, I, again, I think, I think of Ireland, I think of music, a certain kind yeah. of music uh, I think of some writings. Are there aspects of Celtic Christianity that you think we would do well to more fully embrace and incorporate in our own spiritual habits and practices? Is there is there stuff that you have hmm. as a scholar? How has your scholarship of Irish church history shaped your walk with Christ as a 21st century citizen um i i think one of them is their love for learning 
And not just not just uh, like going to college or whatever else, but a, a love for lifelong learning mm-hmm. in relation to not just Christianity. I think another one would be biblical literacy. I think sometimes in in the 21st century, we're so used to having smartphones and having the Bible on our our smartphones. But do we actually have Bible study? Do we actually read the scriptures? And like Lexio Divina, which is called divine reading, it's part of the tradition Mm -hmm. of um, of the Jesuits. Uh, That's another type of um, they have divine reading. In other words, how do you meditate on scripture in order for it to soak into our souls? Mm. Isn't that's a beautiful concept? Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes in the 21st century, because life is so instantaneous, and we're, you know, there's there's 21st century news, noise can drown out our our, our sense of uh, the Lord. And sometimes yeah. taking solitude and retreat is a really good thing to do. Yeah. You know, even for a day, like a lot of Protestant churches don't they don't get the concept of retreat or and retreat doesn't mean retreat. It means retreating just from the world and just being alone with God mm-hmm. for maybe a day or two in, in a monastery that might have a wonderful um, Gregorian chant music, mm. which is just amazing, you know. Um, and that's still uh, very like prevalent in, in Ireland today. Like in, I went to St. Patrick's College in Maynooth, and that's the Catholic College of Ireland. Uh, and I, I trained with the seminarians, even though I, I'm Christian, um, and they welcomed me with open arms, which was wonderful. But they had Gregorian chant music every year uh, in the little chapel and refectory, and I just loved it. It was so, um, it was just heavenly music. Mm. You know, just the well, simple things in, in life, I think, that, that the monks uh, had that we forget. The appreciation yeah. of nature, going on a walk. Okay, this is all seeming very Irish. Um, yeah, it, and, yeah, it probably is. And Celtic. Uh, yeah. So that that may be. Uh, I I may regret asking this question because you have uh, you have sort of brought us uh, to an application point. Mm-hmm. Are is there anything I have not asked you about Patrick or about Irish church history that is glaring and obvious? So maybe I'll. Maybe I'll ask it this way. I know you're teaching classes on Patrick and Celtic spirituality and other things. What what have I not asked? I mean, what's going to be on the final exam for your class that I haven't even uh, I haven't even thought to ask about? Um, I think sometimes it's a bit like what you asked me. How do I apply what I learn about St. Patrick or monasticism and, and, and some of the ancient church history that we have, which is so rich in Ireland? And um, it's to never forget our past, never forget where we come from, in, in a sense of our roots. And if we have roots that are rich, especially in Christian terms, well, why not? Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and 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 preserve some of the things that we've learned from the past and bring it back into the 21st century, like uh, meditating on the scriptures, divine reading, like the love for Christ. How do we do that? And loving other people because they always had guest houses. That's what I, that's one of the things of hospitality about the, the monks that I really enjoyed. We didn't talk about their sense of hospitality and welcoming the stranger was a very big part of their uh, mission in life as well. And that was very prevalent in Ireland. And it's so prevalent today in the 21st century, welcoming the stranger. Okay. Well, well, thank you. This is, um, this is welcome. leveraging St. Patrick's Day uh, for yeah. more than just the Chicago River turning green. Uh, yeah, so, definitely. Uh, Glad for that, and uh, thank you for giving us some of uh, some of your day. And uh, greetings from Chicago to Dublin, and uh, we'll look forward to uh, perhaps some future St. Patrick's Day or some new book you have out or something, some other reason to get together and to talk. So yeah, that was Dr. so lovely meeting you. Thank, thank you very so much. much. God You're bless you. Bye. God Thanks. bless.